We continue our examination of the Morgan case. The court writes, Once one has accepted that the prohibited act in rape is non-consensual sexual intercourse, and that the guilty state of mind is an intention to commit it, as a matter of inexorable logic, either the prosecution proves that the accused had the requisite intent, or it does not. Following the common law convention of interpreting the word intent to mean either purpose or knowledge, we substitute knowingly committed and knowledge in order to grasp the court's point. The opinion continues. Since honest belief clearly negatives intent, the reasonableness or otherwise of that belief can only be evidence for or against the view that the belief was actually held. Substituting, once again, knowledge for intent. We need to pay close attention to what the court is saying. If the prosecution must prove knowledge, it must, of course, prove the accused held a certain belief. The unreasonableness of a belief is always evidence that the belief was not held at all, not honestly and sincerely, at the time the offense is alleged to have occurred perhaps conveniently invented later to avoid conviction. But this is wholly apart from the very different matter of lowering the prosecution's burden by instructing the jury that the element of non-consent may be established by merely showing that the accused was negligent in thinking the victim consented. That view can only have the effect of saying that a man intends something which he does not. That is, that the accused knows something despite not believing it. The Morgan result, quashing the convictions, was unpopular and has been criticized both here and in the UK. The logic of the opinion is impeccable, though, if one accepts the premise that knowledge of non-consent must be shown to convict a man of rape. But if not knowledge, what is the appropriate kind of culpability to require the prosecution to prove? Purpose? Recklessness? Should negligence suffice? Or should proof of non-consent itself suffice without more? Picking the kind of culpability automatically determines what kinds of mistake and ignorance will negate the prosecution's case. As explained in the B. A Minor versus Director of Public Prosecutions case, for any element P, unreasonable belief that not P negates belief that P. Unreasonable belief that not P does not negate negligence as to P. Reasonable belief that not P negates negligence as to P. So when the legislature or a court decides on what kind of culpability to write in or read into a rape statute, it is effectively deciding what kinds of excuses to recognize. Increasing public awareness of the prevalence of sexual violence has brought with it demands to revisit the question of the kind of culpability needed to convict the accused. Some jurisdictions in their zeal to limit the defenses available to defendants, have insisted that only reasonable mistakes can exculpate. For example, this Pennsylvania statute. Ignorance or mistake as to a matter of fact for which there is reasonable explanation or excuse is a defense if it negatives the intent, knowledge, belief, recklessness, or negligence required to establish a material element of the offense. If only a reasonable belief can negate culpability, then negligence is the only operative culpability requirement. The conviction of Kelly, the contractor, ought to be affirmed if this statute applied. A reasonable jury could find that Kelly's mistake about who owned the houses was not reasonable. As for the crime of rape, jurisdictions are, excuse the metaphor, all over the map as to the culpability issue. Take your pick. In the UK, knowledge. In Alaska, recklessness. In New Jersey, negligence. And under Commonwealth versus Lopez, in Massachusetts, no culpability need be shown. 
the defendant takes the risk. The effect of choosing one or the other kind of culpability required to establish the element of non-consent is to raise or lower the likelihood of conviction. The lower the level of culpability the prosecution needs show, the greater the likelihood of getting a conviction, which in turn gives the prosecution greater leverage in plea bargaining. We have to ask ourselves, is the relative ease of getting a conviction a proper factor to consider in deciding what kind of culpability to require?